Let me start by saying that I don't know if I've made uh, many wonderful predictions in life, but um, one of the predictions I did make when I became dean at Haas was that someday Rich would be the dean of Haas. <laughs> and at the time, I wasn't actually thinking about being dean when, when uh, the opportunity presented itself, but at the time, uh, Rich was just a bit too, too young, uh, or at least that's what he said. Uh, and so uh, I became dean, which was one of the great experiences of my life, but I did predict at the time, uh, and I believed uh, f firmly in my prediction that Rich would be the dean, and so I'm very delighted that my prediction came through true. This is a school, uh, Rich mentioned, that has a tremendous sense of community, and each person who is honored enough to be the dean for a while really is building on an enormous amount of, of goodwill and energy. And over the years, the energy has uh, grown, and it's represented in the growing uh, size of this, of this conference. And uh, the school has also, I should say, uh, because we have had a very strong sense of community, and we've built a lot of unique programs. And the unique programs really help us reach other communities. And also, frankly, very important here, they help us raise fees, which allows us to weather uh, state financial crises and continue to expand. So we have been entrepreneurial at the school in terms of building our community through programs and building our revenues uh, through programs. And so it's uh, just wonderful to, to be here this morning with you. Uh, global megatrends. L let, me, let me redefine this a little bit. Uh, one of the things that, uh, a term that McKinsey has come up with is what is the new normal? What is the world looking like and going to look like over the next five years, the economic world, the global economy, compared to what it was before, I think what's ultimately going to go down in the history books maybe as the Great Recession of 2008-2009. It's not another Great Depression, but I think it will go down as a Great Recession. So what is it that the world, what is the new normal? And that's really what I'll talk about. Um, let me say that I think it's important to start here just with a very quick review of what the world, the U.S. economy and the world has traveled through since really the fall of 2008. And of course, in the fall of 2008, the U.S. had already been in a recession for more than a year, but it hadn't yet been called a recession by the National Bureau of Economic Research. To many Americans, it felt like a recession, uh, but it hadn't been called a recession. But then in the fall of 2008, you will remember uh, that we had a, essentially a kind of a, a, the equivalent of, a, of an earthquake, uh, or I've, I thought of it lately in the volcanic eruption, uh, something that was a mega event, uh, it turned out to be, and that was the, the bankruptcy of Lehman and the failure of AIG and then all of the, 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 the near uh, seizure of global capital markets, which very quickly followed. So you hear a lot right now, uh, and it's obviously very much in the news because of financial regulation. You hear a lot about uh, t too big to fail, institutions were too big to fail. I think that misses the point. This was a system failure, okay? This was a system failure. People may not re recall or maybe even know that the, the overnight repo market pretty much closed down. So the way that firms financed themselves was shut. The money market, one money market broke the line and lots of money markets were in danger. This was not just a Lehman event. It was not just a Merrill event. This was a run on the financial system. And I think with, the, with that understanding, one has to actually give the policymakers in the world credit, because not only did we have a run on the system and a seizure of financial markets, you can't run modern economies without functioning financial markets. You can't. And the seizure was also a, a lack, therefore, of confidence. A counterparty confidence was gone. Trust was gone. The, anything that involved extension of credit with any kind of trust was stopped. And of course, the real economy effects were almost overnight. I mean, investors can't invest. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I sit on the chair of AT&T, one of the largest companies in the world. AT&T had trouble raising short-term credit. That is ridiculous. I mean, th this, is a this is a company with a huge balance sheet and huge cash flow. It didn't matter. 
So uh, you had the real economy effects occurring very fast. Investment collapses. Firms start laying people off uh, rather dramatically. Trade plummets. Uh, Barry Eichengreen, who's one of the uh, great professors at the University of California in the economics department, a very good economic historian, they started tracking the declines in things like global trade, global employment, global production, global equity values. And it was really scary because if you start around September of 2008 through about April of 2009, you are literally tracking the Great Depression or worse. The declines were as bad as the Great Depression or in some cases worse. And then the other thing about this is how, you know, you also hear a lot about the interconnectedness of financial institutions, the interconnectedness of economies. It is un the, the way in which this swept through the world, you know, about a year before, the crisis hit. Uh, Goldman Sachs came up with this concept. Well, the emerging markets were so powerful that they were decoupling from what happened in the U.S. or what happened in Europe. So if something bad happened in the U.S. economy or the European economy, nothing really would happen in the emerging market economies. Well, that actually turned out not to be true. In fact, the spread of the crisis was very rapid through trade and through capital flows. And it didn't matter whether you were a country that was in good financial shape like China or in bad financial shape like, say, Hungary, you were hit. You were hit. Um, in 2000, I think it was uh, March of 2009, 75% uh, of the world's economy was contracting. Now, let's take the economies around the world. 75% of them were contracting. And the, the, the ones that weren't were basically just hobbling by. Now, this is really, in thinking about the future, it's important, okay, that's a moment in time. What was happening going into that? Because which, what, what's, what's going to be the future if that happened? Well, it's important to know that before that, if you look at the period 2004 to 2007, say, this was a great time for the world economy. This was really strong stuff. The world economy was growing strongly, and moreover, growth was spreading throughout the world. If you looked at sub-Saharan Africa, you saw growth rates you hadn't seen. You saw them in the Middle East, you saw them in Asia, you saw them in Latin America. Yes, the emerging market countries were actually coming on very dramatically. If you look at the period 2000 and 2007, if I had a PowerPoint, you'd see a, a gap opening up between the growth in the developing world and the growth in the developed world. The U.S. was still a very strong grower during that period of time, don't get me wrong, but you could see the momentum building. And it was widely shared around the world, growth, and it was strong growth. So uh, one of the questions now is, well, will, will we return to that? One thing I will say right away is I think we will return to a world, we are already in it, where uh, the trend of the emerging markets growing substantially faster than the developed world, that trend is not only continuing, but actually the gap in the growth rates has gotten bigger, not smaller, bigger. So the shift of income, production, wealth, generation to emerging markets is going to continue. Um, I'll get to a question later, but one question, that, that period 2004 to 2007, you also saw increasing globalization. What does that mean? Trade as a share of GDP, cap cross-border capital flows as a share of GDP. Up until about 2000, if you taught a course on globalization, you basically said, hmm, any measure of globalization, that is, and usually it's measured by trade flows and capital flows, because people flows, immigration flows, have never been that large in globalization. So trade and capital flows, by 2000, you know what, the world was only just back to where it had been on the eve of World War I. Okay, what happened is the world got uh, much bigger in that century, but for a lot of the 20th century, because of two wars and because of recovering from wars and because of a lot of protectionism around the world, a lot of closed borders, trade and capital flows as a share of GDP never got back to where they were in 1915. By 2000, we were back, fully back, and of course, the world was a much bigger place, so that meant many more people were globalized. But then, after 2000, the world began to break away. That is, we got to new heights of globalization. And this was driven by a couple of important things which are not going to go away, and therefore I think the megatrend of globalization continues. One important thing, the WTO. 
I mean, I, one cannot underestimate the importance of the WTO. I teach a class on emerging markets, and we do a number of case studies. In every single case, of companies that are developed country companies like GE doing something in China, or, uh, or General Motors doing something in China, or Infosys doing something here, or Hire doing something here. In all of those cases, if you look at one of the drivers, it's the WTO. It's the increasing competition that resulted from opening trade. Okay, so that's not going away. We may not be making a lot more progress right now in trade, but one of the great things about the past year is despite a horrific problem of global contraction and capital market seizure, the world did not go backwards in, in protection. It did, it did not, and that's a big comparison to the 1930s where the world comes out ahead. Um, so we have the WTO. What else did we have? Well, we have technology, which makes it almost impossible not to be interdependent. I mean, probably people all around the world, alumni all around the world right now, might be tweeting about uh, what they just heard Rich say. So we can't get away from interdependence. The technology doesn't let us. And then finally, we frankly had a number of countries, very big players, who had historically been kind of inward looking. I think of India here a little bit, and import substitution. I think of Russia, the former Soviet Union. I think of China before 1980, just completely going to we must embrace global capital and global trade flows as a way to develop. So we had policy change, we had a change at the international level, the WTO, uh, and we had technology driving this. So one of the mega trends that, that was part, that was very obvious after 2000 and that will continue, I think, is basically increasing globalization. So now you've got two that are going to continue. One is emerging markets growing more rapidly than developed countries, and two is increasing globalization as measured by trade flows and capital flows as share of GDP. All right, so uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, policy during this period, uh, uh, the 2008-2009 uh, Great uh, Recession, because I think it also tells us something. Um, First of all, it's a great, great opportunity for all economists because everybody is writing about economic policy now and changing their textbooks and all of that. But what have we learned about policy? Uh, I think, first of all, we, this was really a situation where a, a traditional, I would say, Keynesian approach turned out to be correct. And the reason is because when the capital market went into seizure, and when capital flows were pulled dramatically back, that cut into private demand. Basically, investors stopped investing in the real economy. There was a tremendous decline in inventory investment, for example. There was a tremendous decline in capital investment. So that's one big component of domestic demand and global demand that's basically contracting. Consumption is contracting. Why is consumption contracting? Well. Households lo have lost at that time and still have lost a tremendous amount of wealth. So there was a wealth effect on consumption. People feel poorer. They look at their, their assets. They look at their debt. And American households were highly indebted. And they had uh, most American households' main asset is their house. So their house value was falling dramatically. They look at their debt. They say, hey, I can't consume. And that contraction of consumption in turn, the, then you have two major parts of the economy adding demand at one point, now pulling back demand. And as a consequence of that, employment starts to fall, unemployment starts to rise dramatically. That in turn is contraction of demand. That's the sort of Keynesian vicious downward cycle. If consumers stop spending, and then there's less spending power, there'll be less employment, and then consumers will spend even less. So you have a downward cycle. Where's the demand going to come from? Where's the demand going to come from? The economy has a certain amount, and this is true not just in the US economy, but in every economy that went through contraction. So from China to Germany to India to the US to Australia, the same problem. The demand is falling. The economy has a certain supply capability. And the supply capability is being left unutilized. Unutilized capacity, unutilized labor. So where can you get demand? So that's where the governments can come in. 
they can spend on infrastructure, they can spend on unemployment compensation, they can offer tax breaks to encourage people to buy cars, to encourage people to buy first-time houses, to encourage people to, to spend. Uh, they can support the states. One of the major things in the United States, of course, the stimulus, that, that $787 billion of Keynesian relief, demand relief, uh, about a third of it went to the states. And one of the things uh, that I worry a lot about this year is that all money is all going to be pulled out. It's over. It's ended as of the end of this year. And state budgets are in worse shape than they were last year. So I do think in terms of just California, New York, New Jersey, you name it, Aiden, I'm not talking about this as a mega trend, although it feels like a mega trend in the state of California, we have a serious budget problem that no one is talking about uh, at the level of, say, the gubernatorial debates. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been involved in any of that. <laughs> um, so, so the point is that uh, I would say let's think about the uh, crisis and the challenge facing policymakers as the first crisis was a rescue crisis. How to rescue the financial system, the, how to stop the run on the banks, how to stabilize private capital in the financial system. That's, that's part of the rescue. And the other part is how to rescue the real economy from this downward spiral of contracting private demand. Okay, that was the challenge during the rescue period. The rescue period, I think you could argue, started around uh, November of 2008 and basically for the world uh, extended through uh, much of 2009 and by the way the US is still in some ways in a rescue mode because if you look at Federal Reserve interest rates near zero if you look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet it's doubled and now they're starting to talk about selling off some of those assets but they don't want to do it too fast because they don't want to in any way disturb the capital markets uh, the fiscal stimulus, that ARA bill, it's called ARA, uh, is about, probably at this point, about 70% spent out, but there's still 30% less left, a lot of it in infrastructure, a lot of it in support for states. Uh, other governments, you'd see something of the same thing. I mean, massive amounts of government money poured into the system, massive amounts of monetary stimulus poured into the system. And by the way, the monetary stimulus taking all kinds of new forms that had not been seen uh, before. Uh, and so not only were the interest rates low, but, the, but the, the Fed and other central banks were doing things, direct purchases of assets, which had not been done before. So uh, was this all uh, a success? Uh, is it all a success? And wh where do we go from here? So first of all, I think we have to uh, accord policymakers around the world with success. I, I, I honestly think that there will, this is not a period of time which will miss the history books. This will be in the history books. Like the Great Depression, this will be in the history books. And I think it will say some amazing things like, my God, the countries of the world came together in an institution that didn't even really exist. It was just a concept, the G20. You can't find an office for the G20. You can't find a big support staff for the G20. It's just like the G20. We're it. We're the 20 countries that have 80% of the production in the world, and our heads of state and our finance ministers are going to work together to try to figure this out, and our central banks are going to work together, and we're going to work together. And we're going to avoid protectionism, and we're going to do some coordination. And you know what? They actually did. They actually did. And boy, I have to say, relative to the size of the crisis and an untried institution, uh, it's, it is quite, quite successful. So now how do we measure success? And is this short-term success or long-term success? And what's going to happen to policy going forward? I think let's just start with uh, where we are now. And I would go, we went from a successful rescue and now we might say we're in the recovery and rebuild phase. Okay, recovery and rebuild. Okay. Now, recovery. Uh, the, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a, a very well known in the marketing world and there, therefore comes up with very good marketing uh, phrases was at the World Economic Forum in January and he said, I think about recovery around the world as a love phenomena. Now, what does he mean by love phenomena? L-U-V. There are some countries that have slipped dramatically in terms of output growth 
in terms of employment, and they have slipped, and now they're just bouncing around the bottom. So the L is like you fall fairly precipitously. You stop falling, but you don't rise. You, you just kind of, uh, an obvious example here might be Greece. Uh, uh, great concern about a number of countries on the periphery of the European Union. For a while, the concept of the pig's economy, some of you probably know that phrase, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, countries that are in serious trouble, like they're having trouble mo gaining momentum out of the contraction. Um, then there are the ewers, okay? The ewers, and here are probably the US's. Uh, the decline wasn't as steep. It was there, for sure. But the upswing isn't going to be real steep either. It's kind of declined. Now remember, the US is going to end up having one of the longest recessions around, because we started before the contraction of Lehman. So we're going down, 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 down. We kind of get to the bottom, it looks like, around the uh, summer to fall of 2009, and now we're coming out. And we're coming out. Now, the U is, we didn't go like this, kapum, kapum. We're not, we're not anywhere back to where we were. But we're slowly coming out. Um, and that is a recovery. That is a recovery period. Uh, it is likely to be relatively slow compared to what we might have hoped, given how long we were in a recession and how much we suffered but it is underway. And then the veers, uh, the veers are those countries that were supposed to be decoupled, that weren't supposed to be pulled down by us. They were pulled down fast, but they got out fast. They've gotten out quite quickly. So they go down dramatically in a very short period of time. If you look at China or you look at India, you look at uh, some of the Latin American countries, look at the Asian economies, they fell very much, very rapidly, but for a short period of time. And then they turn around and they came out quite rapidly. So if you look at that, you can say that uh, the Asia Pacific, uh, for example, is growing eight times as fast as Europe. Uh, now, I would say that the good news here is Europe, the U.R., I mean, the U.S., a U.R., is growing about 60% faster than uh, Europe. But I think in general what you'd say is it's kind of a tale of two kinds of recovery, a tale of two recoveries. And we will see this, I would say, it's not just a recovery phase, but this goes to a point I made earlier about a mega trend. The growth rates of the emerging market economies, particularly those in the Asia region, are going to be substantially faster than the growth rates in the US, which will probably be one of the stronger developed economies, over the, as far as the eye can see, really as far as the eye can see. And you might say, well, why? Well, one reason is that before the crisis, there were some long-term trends underway. Uh, emerging markets were, had very rapid growth in, in, in labor supply. They had great uh, opportunities for productivity growth because part of development is moving your population from lower productivity activities to higher productivity activities. So uh, getting to the frontier, the spread of technology, uh, the spread of management innovation, uh, throughout the economy, in an economy like India, or an economy like Mexico, an economy like Brazil, an economy like, uh, like uh, China, that, that, that will add growth. So these countries have very rapidly growing labor supplies, and they have rapid growth in productivity. And you know, the long run growth rate of an economy depends upon those two things, the rate of growth of the labor supply and the rate of growth of productivity. And they have uh, both much stronger than the developed economies. The other thing that's true is that the emerging market economies had those that had had uh, imbalance problems like big trade deficits or big uh, fiscal deficits in 1997 and 1998 when the Asia financial crisis hit, they had learned their lesson. So a lot of these emerging market economies went into this crisis in much sounder macroeconomic shape than some of the uh, developed countries. I put the US as one of the countries that went in not in good shape. We had a fiscal deficit, structural fiscal deficit, that probably was around 3% of GDP. That means whether the economy was in a boom or in a bust, we had a deficit of 3.5% three, three of GDP. Well, that's not a good place to start a big crisis because you know in a big crisis the government's going to have to run a big deficit. The history of financial crises tells you 
that government debt on average doubles. Okay, so we were starting from a not real strong position. Well, China was starting from a great position. They had huge reserves. They, had, they could spend a trillion dollars easily to support their economy. No problem. Um, so the, several of the emerging market economies were strong going in. They didn't have the balance sheet problems on their banks either, so they come out of this really fast. So the LUV, the countries that fall sharply and are bouncing around the bottom and it's hard to see how they exit. The U, the U is a little bit, I would say, the US, Australia, Canada, a number of some of the bigger, we, we'll see about the continental European economies. I think it's not clear. There's a debate going on what's going to happen there. Uh, and then the V-shaped the v uh, recoveries are definitely the emerging market recoveries. And the long-run trend here is, as I said, that they will continue to grow uh, considerably faster than the developed countries. Now, I thought because I said that this was a global megatrend, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on the U.S. Uh, economic outlook. I'm happy to do that in questions, but, but I do want to say a couple of things about this because say let's go from the recovery phase. If, if we believe, and most economists now believe, that the U.S. is in a recovery phase. It's not threatened by an imminent uh, double dip into recession again or anything else, but, but the, we do have some real issues here which I think get to structural issues. So uh, the main one I want to talk about is the labor market for a minute in the United States because it also gets to the issue of education and high school and, and everything else. Um, I was speaking to an MIT alum last night because I was at a, an event for, uh, for uh, MIT and uh, he said to me, you know, how did, he said, the administration has a lot of smart economists and I said, yes. He said, so how did they, <laughs> no, they do, they have a lot of smart economists. Absolutely, including one for, you know, including uh, Christy Romer from the University of California, Berkeley. So yes, these are very smart economists. How did they get that employment number so wrong? You know, it's like you go out and you predict the unemployment rate is going to be one thing, and you're, it turns out at the end of 2009, there's a million fewer jobs than you thought, and the unemployment rate is 10 rather than less than 9. What, what, how did they get it so wrong? And I said, the sad thing is they actually ran a bunch of models. They ran the best models we have in the country to predict the unemployment rate. And the models failed. The models failed. And he said, yeah, he said, I won't say this. He said, hey, they should have been like the Bush administration and just made up the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, not me. I, I want to say, I, I didn't say that, but I, I, it made me laugh, actually. I said, yeah, I'm going to tell Christy Rover that. Stop being so scientific and just make up a good number. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, the, we, 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 uh, have had a problem predicting the labor market in the United States for quite some time. If you look at the period 2000 to 2007, you have uh, what we've now come to call in economics a kind of the, a, a version of the jobless economic recovery. We had a jobless economic recovery also in the 1990s, uh, from in the first years of recovery from the early 1990s recession. What does that mean, a jobless recovery? It means somehow or the, the link between output and employment growth in the United States based on history no longer works based on history. The output growth exceeds the employment growth by quite a lot. We can't, we can't uh, predict. Uh, so what happened, and, and, and that fact means also when uh, you have uh, a recession, it turns out, that the collapse in employment is bigger than you would predict by the collapse in output. So uh, this is something which has been with the U.S. economy now for close, I would say, 20 years, three, three, three recessions. Uh, and this is a big issue. And it's a big structural issue because you also see it to some extent manifest a slightly different way in uh, the developed economies. So about the other developed economies. Let's think about Europe for a minute. One of the things that's been pointed out is the output contractions in Europe were similar or more severe than the output contraction in the United States, but the employment contraction was less. Okay, so we had much bigger employment contraction than they did. 
Now, part of that, a lot of that, is our policy environment. We, we have, you know, we, we talked about flexible, flexible decision making. Well, flexible decision making means that uh, you decide you're going to lay off your workers, you lay off your workers, okay? And it's much more difficult to do that in Europe. And so, in that sense, we end up with uh, this uh, greater employment sensitivity to the business cycle. Okay. But there's something comparable between the uh, economies, and this is a worrisome long-run trend, and it gets to one of the reasons why we must, this must be happening, and that is technology. Because we can see very clearly something called the polarization of the labor market. The polarization of the labor market is we have kind of two areas where you might see uh, growth in employment opportunities. The bottom and the top. And by the top I mean college educated or post-college educated. And then the bottom, personal services, uh, janitorial services, gardening services, uh, hair services, uh, health services, uh, and of course when the economy is booming that also means uh, restaurant services, hotel services, tourism services, etc. In the middle is where you can't see the employment growth. And this is a very, you know, this is unnerving, this is a big policy challenge for the developed countries because coming out of a recession now in the United States, we have this gap between job growth and, and output growth. And then furthermore, where the job growth is going to occur may in fact leave out portions of middle income opportunities. And this is a very big structural problem. It existed before the crisis, it exists after the crisis. And the crisis makes it worse because a lot of jobs that were destroyed in that 2009 period are not going to come back. Because one of the things that companies figured out how to do was to reorganize uh, around technology and around outsourcing and trade and all the rest of it to maintain employment, to maintain output at a faster pace than employment. And I, I think that is uh, the case. So uh, I don't have a, a series of solutions for this other than to say that one of the things that is true is that for institutions of higher education like this one, um, it is very important that the, the job opportunities at the top look to be, continue to be strong by comparison. You know, if you think about the unemployment rate in the United States right now, we say it's around a little, less than uh, 10, somewhere in the nines, I think about the nine or seven, I can't remember exactly. But if you actually break that down by education level, it's really quite different. So the unemployment rate for uh, people with uh, post-doc education is below 5%, uh, whereas the unemployment rate of people who have only a high school education is like 15%. So we, and, and that's because those low, a lot of those low-income jobs haven't come back yet because we haven't yet gone into the kind of consumption boom that would su support them. All right, so I just, I just wanted to say that that is a structural challenge confronting not just the U.S. but the other developed countries. And the U.S., you know, the other developed countries have a slower growth of labor supply than we do. So our problem is a little, uh, you might say, a little more severe because we have a more rapidly growing labor supply. So just to bring people in to the, back into the job market is going to require a lot of job growth. And uh, that's why almost it, all there, are, if you go look at economic forecasts for the United States, they differ in terms of growth rate, but actually whether you are pretty much of an optimist or a pessimist, Everybody is around the same view that the average unemployment rate stays at over 5%, close to 6% through 2015. That's a long period of weak job growth. Now, why does this matter? This gets me to the, to the next R. So I've talked about uh, recover, rescue and recovery, and I want to talk about something that only economists would, would name. It's called rebalancing. Sounds so really exciting to the average uh, person. 
But rebalancing is an important concept, but let me get to it by saying, let's think about the growth dynamics of the world economy from the period 2002 to 2007. Let's think about the U.S. consumer. Let's think about the U.S. labor market. Let's think about the problem of having a large number of Americans not fully employed. A key to understanding that wonderful period of shared growth around the world from 2002 to 2007 was the American consumer. Okay, the engine uh, accounting for, uh, by itself, the hard-pressed American consumer, uh, basically, remember, we have 5% of the world's population, and not all of our population is of consuming age. We were carrying about 15 to 20% of global demand. We were spending, come on, this, we were spending. Part of the savings rate going to zero, part of borrowing against your house, part of the whole notion of the spendthrift American, Hey, the Spencer of America was really good news for a lot of the emerging markets. We helped drive the price of oil to the $140 range, created huge amount of wealth and income and investment in the Middle East and in Russia. Hey, we bought, uh, uh, we bought the bulk, a uh, very large fraction of China's exports of manufactured goods. Uh, that was good news for China. They had a huge export bubble. If you look at China going into 2001, 2002, the WTO hits. It's an open economy. Money starts pouring into China to make foreign direct investment. A lot of that money is coming from U.S. firms. A lot of the products are basically being sold here. We buy them. So they have an export boom. We have a consumption boom. All right, so now that dynamic can't hold anymore. It can hold for a variety of reasons. Number one, the U.S. consumer has really been hit. They've lost a substantial amount of wealth in their homes. Maybe, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we can say maybe the last estimate I heard from Marty Felstein just a couple weeks ago, $10 trillion lost in wealth for American households. Uh, most households, as I said, their home is their, uh, is their asset. Uh, Secondly, uh, American households had been saving essentially nothing, so we have to have an increase in the savings rate. We've seen that. It's not gone up too high yet, but say it's gone from 2% to 3% to 4%. You save more, you consume less out of every dollar. So macroeconomics tells you consumption growth is going to be slower. Uh, and then uh, you have paying down debt. One of the reasons that consumers have to tighten their belts a bit is that they have to bring down their debt levels. And they are. They are. That's the deleveraging process for households. So all of that suggests that the U.S., if you think about the U.S. economy for a minute, growth has to be rebalanced, that is rejiggered, that is reallocated, from less dependence on consumption to more dependence on investment as a source of demand and exports as a source of demand. So again, let's go back to the simple, where does demand come from? Consumption, exports, investment, government spending. I'll talk in a minute about the government, but the deficit problem suggests the government's going to have to contract. The consumer, while they may not be no longer contracting, are certainly not going to go back to the heyday of consuming at a pace that far exceeds their income growth. That's what was happening in the decade leading up to 2007. Uh, American consumers were, the growth of consumption was a percentage point, in some years, two percentage points higher than the growth of income. That can't hold. Okay, so what, all you have left there, if, if government's contracting and consumers slowing down, is investment and exports. Investment and exports. Which is why the investment economy, the innovation economy, and the export agenda for the United States is so important. That's the rebalancing challenge for the U.S. But there's a huge rebalancing challenge for the world, too, because remember, the U.S. consumer was a major driver of what was going on. We have to shift to other sources of demand, and that's why you hear a lot about the importance of what China does, because in that period 2002 to 2007, the two major drivers of the economy, think about engines, the global economy, were the U.S. and China, and they had this very interesting interdependence where the U.S. would consume and create a lot of demand, and China would produce a lot of supply. I mean, that's just uh, a rough configuration. So for the last year or two, there's been a discussion underway. Gee, the U.S. has to invest more and export more. China must save less, consume more, rely less on exports to the United States, and become more of a source of demand for 
the world economy. That's a shift. It's not something that happens overnight. I mean, China has invested in a certain way. It's built up a huge amount of export capacity. It doesn't have necessarily a huge amount of capacity for the domestic economy. It's building it very rapidly, but it, it takes time. So that is the rebalancing challenge. And I actually think here the news so far is actually pretty good. It's pretty good. U.S. savings rates of households are rising. Investment has been quite strong. Uh, the challenge of finding exports, you know, uh, you all probably say, and many people say when they hear this, well, gosh, the U.S. has lost all this manufacturing capability. What, what are we, what are we going to export? We, what are we going to export? Well, actually, we have a lot of manufacturing capability in the United States. We, we, we are actually a major manufacturing exporter already. It's not a very labor-intensive manufacturing base, but we actually uh, sell a lot of manufacturing exports, and we sell a lot more, and then, of course, we can sell a lot of service exports. So bringing students to the University of California, Berkeley, and educating them, that's an export service for the United States, and a very important one, actually. Uh, I do worry a little bit about financial services, because our biggest export of services it, to the world has been financial services, and we are uh, in the process of changing our regulation in such a way and this is not an argument against uh, regulation, it's just a reality. We actually may end up being a less attractive export base for financial services because some countries are not going to regulate the proprietary trading of their big banks. They're not going to do it, okay? And some of them are not going to regulate the derivatives market the way we're going to regulate the derivative market. So if they don't, and we do, then maybe our exports of financial services become less important. But the point is, I do think that watch for a world over the next five years where there's much more demand growth and not what I would say domestic demand growth in countries like India and China and Brazil and uh, Saudi Arabia and in the US much more investment and export opportunities. That, that's really if you're thinking about it from a business point of view the rebalancing uh, plays out that way and it's really essential that that occurs because at the end of the day, what was fundamentally not sustainable about the U.S. being such a driver of global demand was that in order to fuel that demand, the U.S. was borrowing dramatically from the rest of the world. And that was the cur that showed up, it peaked out around 7% of U.S. GDP, a current account deficit. And no one thought that was sustainable. You, you know, the U.S. might run a current account deficit of three then you'd have a sort of stabilization of net foreign indebtedness. 3% would be okay. Seven, our foreign indebtedness was, the stock was just growing dramatically relative to the size of the economy. So not possible. We won't go back there. Uh, so now the real challenge is where do we go? If we don't get the appropriate amount of rebalancing, I think what that means for the world economy is just slower growth. It just means slower growth. The U.S. can't provide the same amount of growth if it doesn't come from the emerging markets and more emphasis on domestic demand, the world economy will grow slower than it did in 2000 to 2007. Okay, so what are some other uh, trends we might talk about? Let me, let me talk about the fiscal issue because I do think this is a mega trend and not just for the U.S., but we're seeing it played out in Greece right now. And by the way, I would be interested in people's answer to this question because I get asked this quite a lot. What's the difference between California and Greece? <laughs> it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. A very good question. Uh, we're not in the EU. <laughs> I, 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 that's how I start with you. But, but let me just start with, again, just go back from the U.S to the uh, lessons of fiscal crises. So people ought to talk about what, their, what is their favorite book about the global uh, financial crisis. And you know, people, oh, too big to fail. I like the big short. I like, you know, the house of cards. Well, economists like Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, it's a big book like this. It's called This Time It's Different. And it's a whole bunch of data about financial crises from around the world at different periods of history. Okay? It's really gripping reading. <laughs> I don't think there's a single person name. See, if you look at structural forces, it doesn't matter, is it Lehman Brothers or is it Dick Fold or it doesn't matter. Structure. Okay. So one of the things that in this book is 
When there are these big financial crises, governments have to take on a lot of debt. They take it on for two reasons. They've got to go in and s salvage the financial system. That costs money. And sometimes they get a lot of the money back, but it, doesn't, it takes a while. And they have to generate all this demand for a while. So the debt doubles, more than doubles, whatever. And that, and that problem is a long-term problem. The future pays for that problem. It, it is something that has to be paid for. The government did something for the system. Uh, but the future pays. So what does that mean? It means that uh, governments around the world have to worry about their budgets. They have to worry about how to allocate their resources. They have to worry about whether to increase revenues, and if so, how. Uh, they have to make very tough choices between, say, uh, education, you know, the discretionary spending in the U.S. economy is going to be less than the interest payment on the debt. The interest payment on the debt is going to be comparable, if it's not already there, to all of our defense spending. Okay? We, we, you run a lot of debt, you got to pay a lot of interest. And of course, you can say, well, okay, that's a transfer. The people, you know, some people are paying taxes, the interest is going to others. Yeah, but a lot of our interest is being paid to the rest of the world because we borrowed from the rest of the world. So a lot of that interest is going out to the rest of the world. But I, I just want to say that we are going to be. Uh, there are both economic consequences and also political consequences of this because when countries run big debt uh, and run big deficits, it does lead to a lack of confidence, a lack of trust. You see that, you know, the Americans now, what is, what's the trust in the U.S. Congress? 20 percent? Okay. And they're sitting there going, look at this government. It's spending all this money. The deficit to GDP ratio, to the extent any American can call that number is 9%. The debt to GDP ratio is rising inexorably over the next decade. This government is not doing the right thing. And they haven't, unfortunately, read Reinhardt and Rogoff, so they don't know that this is just kind of what happens. Um, so you do have uh, very tough politics and very tough uh, economics, and there's always the risk, and I, I really want to emphasize this risk because the world saw the risk realized in the 1930s, and we saw the risk in Japan in, 19, in the 1990s, that governments are put under enormous pressure either by the credit market, that is freaked out investors who don't want to buy government bonds anymore, or by their uh, citizens, they're put under enormous pressure to start cutting the deficit and reducing the debt before the economy is capable of sustaining growth if that happens. Because remember, the reason all of this occurred was consumption growth, private demand was weak. Consumption growth was weak. Investment demand was weak. The world trade was weak. The government came in and provided demand. Now, if the government comes in and says, okay, we're raising revenues, we're cutting spending, we hope, fingers crossed, that consumers will be strong enough and investors will be strong enough to make up that difference. But do we know that? So that's why Bernanke keeps saying, I I'm not convinced. Bernanke, you know, is under enormous pressure from the credit markets. He's under enormous pressure from the press. You know, raise interest rates. The economy is recovering. It's okay. You better do this. There's going to be an inflation problem if you don't. And he's saying, you know, it's really a weak recovery. I don't see yet the employment generation and the consumption generation and the recovery in housing prices enough to really think that if I pull back dramatically on monetary stimulus, the economy will just soar along. And the other authorities, other monetary authorities in the developed world feel the same way. And if you look at the fiscal situation, uh, this year's deficit to GDP ratio is bigger than last year's. The president is calling for cutting the deficit from, a, from more than 9% of GDP down to 3.9% by 2015. So he's cutting it in half, more than, more than half as a share of GDP. And during that whole time, the economy has more than around, at, at best, 6% unemployment. So you're doing fiscal contraction when the private economy is still very weak. Why? Well, because the bond market's worried, because you're worried about, uh, t you know, uh, investors walking away from U.S. debt, because the politics are such that, believe me, the deficit will be a huge, huge issue in the 2010 
election, and it will be a huge, huge issue in the 2012 election. And from a historical point of view, you'd say, well, the governments did the right thing. Now they have to figure out the pace of pulling back. Okay, so that's a little bit about rebalancing, rebalancing government accounts, rebalancing the, the composition of aggregate demand in the economy. Let me just end with uh, one other R, so, um, and this is uh, regulation. So we had rescue, we had recovery, we have rebalancing ongoing and a lot of uncertainty about that, uh, and we have regulation. And of course, it seems appropriate to talk about that R right now since it's so uh, front and center uh, in, in the news. Um, I would have preferred myself, I, I think one of the things that we know is that our capital markets are highly interconnected. Uh, the developed country capital markets are highly connected and our financial institutions are highly interconnected. Uh, so it is a bit problematic to have uh, the U.S. moving out quickly as in for major financial reform uh, with other things going on. This, this, this comment was made yesterday by the head of the IMF who said, you know, we're trying to come up with various ways to tax financial institutions. In Basel, we're trying to come up with various ways to increase capital requirements and liquidity requirements. Uh, there's discussion underway in the financial, there's a board set up by the G20 that's talking about compensation practices. And then in the middle of all of this, the, the U.S. comes up and says, well, this is how we're going to handle the resolution of, of the resolution issue of if a company gets into trouble how we bring it into bankruptcy and this is how we're going to handle derivatives and this is how we're going to handle uh, supervision and, we're, and so a little bit of uh, my concern is we put in place something and then uh, it's somehow inconsistent uh, with the rest of the world. But I do think that uh, there, there were, it was always obvious uh, the main features of what regulation needs to be. Uh, not the details, but the main features, and, and what is being discussed in the Congress does address a lot of these issues. I mean, uh, one thing was uh, what to do with institutions that, I don't like the term too big to fail, so I would say too interconnected to fail, or what to do with large financial institutions with lots of interconnections around the world when they are they need to be resolved. They need to be go into bankruptcy. There needs to be a normalized proceeding which can act quickly uh, and does not create the kind of uncertainty uh, that the Lehman bankruptcy created. So that's one thing. Uh, a second thing is transparency and that is being dealt with very much now in terms of bringing uh, large institutions, and then the question is what is large? Right now they're calling them systemically important institution under supervision. Going into the crisis, more than half of the U.S. capital market was in shadow banking, unsupervised, unregulated institutions. So that is going to change, and that's in the bill. Um, and I guess I would say the, the last important area in transparency is not just supervision, but information. And that really has to do with bringing a lot of this derivative activity into exchanges, into clearing houses, where people understand exactly exposures and how large they might be. So there will be uh, continuing work on regulation. One of the dangers in not doing it uh, in a more coordinated way is if you added up the Basel, what, what the proposed capital and liquidity requirements are from Basel with, say, the new International Monetary Fund proposal for a fat tax, a, fat tax, a financial activities tax, is a great name, fat tax. Um, It'll help it get passed, actually, <laughs> at all, all, all of the things that we're doing in the U.S., uh, the burden on financial institutions would be huge. It would be huge. You, so we, I, I think what you conclude here is we are going to have, for many years, and this is a mega trend, more costly capital, less risk capital. That's what we want. We think the companies took on too much risk. They, the ca cost of capital was too low, it encouraged people to do things which had high amounts of risk, so we're going to have a world of more expensive capital with less risk. That's a mega trend, I would say. Uh, and so uh, 
let me give you a couple other megatrends. I talked about uh, the, the megatrend of uh, the emerging markets. I talked about the megatrend of polarization. I've just talked about higher cost of capital and less risk. Um, let me just end with one that's really interesting, and that is the role of governments in economic life. Economic life. The rise of emerging markets, remember, the largest and most successful emerging market is China. Uh, that is still a state, largely state-run economy. It is not to say that there's not a huge amount of entrepreneurial activity. There is. A huge amount of innovation. There is. A huge amount of uh, risk-taking for uh, commercial profit. There is. But it's also a society in which uh, you still have uh, very large state-owned enterprises. A lot of my friends in China say that one of the things that's happened as a result of the crisis is a state-owned enterprise have become more powerful, not less, not less, because they are the employers, they've gotten a large amount of the stimulus money, they have spent it to secure their positions, uh, they are now the beneficiaries of new policy in China to favor indigenous innovation. So basically, you know, GEs and Cisco's are complaining that, you know, they go in and bid on a project and then uh, the Chinese authorities said, well, actually, we, we want to choose a company that's Chinese that actually does the same kind of thing you do. Um, sovereign wealth funds. Um, sovereign wealth funds now, uh, including the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, these are the, the big funds that governments have amassed. So they're about almost $4 trillion. Uh, they are more than twice, uh, they're more than 50% as large uh, as uh, the uh, total of private equity and hedge funds in the entire world. Okay, so basically there's a pool of money out there that is sovereign money to be invested in commercial entities around the world. And it's bigger than the pool of private equity and hedge fund money. So I'm just saying that you, if you think about, in America we tend to think, okay, well we're going to have more regulation in the financial markets, or gee, how long is the government going to own General Motors? I would say not very long, by the way. I, I want to say that uh, General Motors is zooming ahead in China and it's got a great CEO. And I, I actually believe that uh, General Motors will very, very quickly not be. So Americans are worrying about it in the US. Oh, well, is the government going to have a bigger role in health? And all? The real issue is in the world, the, as you move, as you shift to rising importance of emerging markets, there is actually probably a rising role of government in the global economy right now and for the foreseeable future. So that's an interesting mega trend. So why don't um, I stop there. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see everybody here. Haas is wonderful. Rich is wonderful. You're all wonderful. And, let's, and by the way, the key thing for us, really, if you think about, go back to the US economy for a minute. If you think about it from the US economy's point of view, we have to worry about education because the only way to handle that polarization issue is to get more Americans through college into postgraduate school. We used to be number one in that. We're number 14 now among the OECD countries. We've fallen from one to 14. Uh, we have one of the highest dropout rates in the world in high school. We have many too many students only completing high school, if at all. Uh, it's, it's a huge issue for us in terms of skilling people to the level required for those jobs that are created by technology towards the top of the income distribution. Uh, so I would urge all of you to do that. And then the second thing is innovation. So we go to, again, to, to Haas and what distinguishes Haas. Uh, the key for America in terms of the long run rebalancing is can we innovate? Can we continue to innovate? And where? Innovation drove a lot of the growth boom of the period 1996 to 2002, uh, and we need to worry about the next round of, of innovation. So the Haas School should be able to solve both of those problems. Thank you. <laughs>